Hello, everybody, and welcome to a lobby lecture that is not taking place in the lobby. However, if you're watching this at all, I suspect you have a ticket to our production, Pacific Opera's production of Don Giovanni. Um, and I hope you're as excited as I am that we are going back to the Royal Theatre to see opera. My name's Robert Holliston, and I've probably met some of you before in the Royal Theatre lobby. And I'm here now to talk to you a little bit about the opera Don Giovanni that you're going to see, a little bit about its background and the musical selections that you're going to hear, a little bit about the components that make up this kind of opera and what it is, and a few things that you might want to think about in terms of the story as you're watching it. Uh, the first thing that you can imagine is that we can go all the way back to 1786. And that was the year that Mozart and his collaborator Lorenzo da Ponte put together a fairly scandalous indictment of the ruling classes called The Marriage of Figaro. Now, this was a pretty good success in Vienna, but it was an overwhelming success in Prague, a city that took Mozart to its heart like no other. And interestingly enough, it was the kind of success that we almost don't really know today. Uh, Mozart went to Prague to hear the performance and said that they were whistling the tunes from Figaro everywhere in the plazas, in the hotels, in the cafes, in the restaurants. If they'd had elevators, they would have been playing it in the elevators. Um, and so this was a tremendous personal success for both of the artists, actually. And the manager of the Prague Opera House was very, very happy with it because, of course, it meant financial success for him. And then, as now, running an opera house is a pretty sh d difficult business when it comes to staying in the black rather than the red. And so Mozart was asked to compose a piece specifically for the season at Prague the next year. And that's where Don Giovanni came about. Uh, Mozart went back to Vienna and ran to Lorenzo de Ponte's home and asked him to give him a new text for a new opera. As it happens, de Ponte was writing two other projects and was a little bit concerned he wouldn't have time to do justice to it. But when they had the idea to write a story about Don Juan, thinly veiled as one of Casanova's uh, identities, um, it happened that de Ponte already had access to a couple of other texts. So it was already a work in progress. Now, the idea of one librettist, or for that matter, one composer, borrowing material from another was very, very standard during the 18th century. They didn't have the fetish about originality and copyright laws that we have today. And so they went ahead. Some of the work was already done. And so Don Giovanni came to be born in Prague in 1787. And it, too, would transfer over to Vienna. But I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, if you haven't heard anything about this incredible figure of Lorenzo da Ponte, now is the time. Uh, da Ponte was born a few years before Mozart in a kind of Jewish ghetto in Venice. And this happened so often in the 18th century. His mother died when he was only a small child. So he, his two siblings, and his father were left bereft. His father fell in love with a Gentile girl, and in those days, all that was necessary for a Jewish citizen to marry a Gentile was simply for the family to convert. And the bishop that performed the conversion was called Lorenzo da Ponte. And so, in accordance with the tradition, the young lad of the family took the bishop's name and was intended for a career in the priesthood, and he was groomed for this. So he was actually qualified to perform masses. It's unlikely that there has been anyone in the history of the Roman Catholic Church less suited to the role of a priest for several reasons. So the first is literary. Lorenzo was very, very gifted in terms of improvising poetry. It was said he could improvise poetry the way Mozart could improvise music. Uh, and he had had the good fortune to be trained in the school by a Jesuit priest who happened also to have a passion for poetry, for literature, for Latin and Greek classics. So Lorenzo got a terrific education in terms of actually being a very significant literary figure. That was one of the reasons that he wasn't suited for the priesthood. He, he just didn't, he didn't have that passion. But another one was that he was a radical. I guess we would call him a little bit of a political hothead. Uh, so not only did he espouse unconventional views, he also had the literary ability to express them very pointedly and with a great deal of sarcasm and wit, which only drove the points home further. So he also was one of those people 
who felt that the world kind of owed him a living. So he'd, he'd run up huge debts everywhere and not really have any intention of ever paying them back. So he had to sort of slip out of town under cover of darkness more than once. Also, and this is probably the thing that's most important, he had an insatiable appetite for the ladies. Not unlike Don Giovanni, as a matter of fact. It might be a little bit of semi-autobiographical fiction that we find in here. And especially he liked to toy with ladies who were already either engaged to be married or were actually married to other men. And uh, so he often had to flee under cover of darkness to escape the wrath of husbands and fathers and boyfriends and uncles and brothers, etc. So that's, that's our guy who wrote the text for the opera you're going to see. I'll just very briefly tell you this. Uh, after Vienna became just too small for Lorenzo da Ponte, he moved to London. He had a wife by this point, believe it or not. And London also proved too small for him because he ran up debts everywhere. So he ended up ultimately in New York City teaching at Columbia University, or what is now Columbia University. Somewhere out there, somewhere in greater New York City are the bones of Lorenzo da Ponte, who lived to be almost 90 years old. Wonderful story to read if you ever get the chance. So they collaborate on this musical project. And what exactly is it? Uh, is it, as some people call it, a drama giocoso, which would mean it's comic, but it's also very dramatic. And it certainly is. There is a death that occurs at the beginning. And there's the bringing down of the villain to hell. The dissolute punished is the alternate title for this at the end. But there are, all the way through it, very, very comic elements and overtones as well. And the epilogue brings back a kind of uh, semi-serious, largely comic ending. Mozart, in his catalog, called it an opera buffa, or a comic opera. But all of Mozart's opera buffa are, have underlying elements of poignant seriousness, even potential unhappiness. Mozart was, if anything, a rounded artist. So you may call it what you will. I'm just, telling that, I'm just saying this, that there was a little bit of um, discussion and contention uh, in the intervening decades since it was first produced. About the ending, we'll get to a little bit later. Um, in terms of how serious the opera is, I'm just going to begin by playing you the opening of the overture, which tells us from the very beginning that this is pretty serious stuff. doesn't do the same thing as the opening of Figaro does. It's obviously something that's going to be weighty that we're going to watch. Now, with this overture, I want to tell you one other thing. Uh, not that long ago, the Victoria Symphony actually put the overture of the marriage of Figaro into one of their programs. And it stands perfectly well all by itself as a standalone piece. The overture to Don Giovanni doesn't. It gets quick. It gets lively, but it ends in a sort of unresolved chord that means we have to move forward. We can't just stop with this. So after a piece that's essentially in this key, we find ourselves in this key. Hanging in midair, as it were, to wait for a resolution, and we get it with the first number of the piece. I'm going to show you what it goes like and then tell you a little bit about a few characters that we meet right at the beginning and give you a question to ask yourself throughout the entire duration of the evening. Which is a tune that was so beloved by Beethoven that he used it in his colossal set of piano variations known as the Diabelli variations. I like these little ways that history joins hands with itself. In any case, this introduces us to Leporello. Leporello, what a great name. Is, uh, it sounds like a pasta, but it's actually the name of Don Giovanni's personal manservant. So we first of all, as in Figaro, we begin the opera by meeting one of the servants. 
and Leporello's complaining because he, all, all he ever does is hang around while the Don fiddles around with the ladies and has, and has a good time and enjoys himself and then runs off leaving Leporello to pick up after him and to clean up all his messes. Not quite what happens in this particular case. Now during that overture, some of which is very serious, some of which is very lively, the Don is in the home of an aristocratic lady named Donna Anna. And Donna Anna lives in the home with her father, the Commendatore. And so at, after Leporello's complaints, the Don rushes out onto the stage, pursued by Donna Anna, and she does not know his identity. They would be familiar with each other, but she doesn't know that the masked man that has been inside her house at night trying to interfere with her, she does not know it's the Don because he was disguised. She just knows that a man was in her house. And following her is her father, the Commendatore, who challenges this reprobate to a duel. And here's where we have to make a couple of decisions, or we have to observe at least one thing. The first one is this. How successful was Don Giovanni in, his, in, in consummating his attempted seduction of Donna Anna? Now, you may make up your own mind, but I'm, I'm going to tell you this. During the course of the opera, he attempts to make it with a couple of female characters and is never successful. His attempts are always thwarted. Personally, I don't think he ever actually uh, consummates a successful seduction at any point, including the overture. I suspect he does when he's down in hell, though, because after all, as we know, we go to heaven for the temperature and hell for the company. So in any case, we have the Don fleeing the scene of either a crime or an attempted one, except he's topped by the commendatore who challenges him to a duel. Now, this is what I want you to remember. You can think about the, what went on in the house, but what happens right in front of our very eyes is that Don Giovanni does his best to convince the old man not to fight with him. The Don is a young, virile, attractive, fit fellow who is going to win this fight, but the commendatore insists that they go ahead, and inevitably, Don Giovanni kills the commendatore. This does not happen often in operas from the 18th century, but I will tell you this the commendatory comes back to life. More about that later, too. So the Don has, in fact, killed an old man, and Leporello has witnessed it. So the next person we're going to meet is named Donna Elvira. Now, for us, when we think of Donna, we think of it as a girl's name. It's like a, uh, an honorific amongst the uh, um, aristocracy. So we know that Elvira is another aristocrat. Unlike Donna Anna, she has been... Um, She's had her fun with uh, Don Giovanni, and Don Giovanni has convinced her that he wants to marry her. He uses this as a ploy to get girls into bed. He says, well, come to my house, and then I'll marry you. I think for him it's a euphemism for you know what. In any case, he has abandoned Elvira, and here she is chasing after him. Um, she's usually portrayed as something of a hysteric, certainly with larger-than-life emotions. And uh, she is constantly pursuing Don Giovanni, convinced that she can get him to come back to her and marry her, or at least she can wreak her revenge. So in an in, aria, I'd like to demonstrate a little bit. I would call it the first really incredible full-blown aria in the piece. We have Elvira left alone on stage with Leporello the servant, again, cleaning up after the Don's messes. The reason I'm showing you this is as follows. Leporello is a quintessentially comic role but there's nothing quintessential or conventional about Mozart's treatment of such roles. So he gives Leporello a lot of comic material to work with, but also makes sure he has to be sung by a really good singer. So in this little aria, Leporello addresses Donna Elviro as Madamina, or Little Madam, which is a little bit offensive coming from a servant to an aristocrat. But he says, let me tell you. And he picks up a little black book, and he tells this woman how many conquests the Don has made in all the countries of Europe that he's visited. It culminates in over a thousand in Spain alone. <laughs> like For a long time as he sings very quickly, and she's getting more and more and more horrified when, as she realizes she's not just one out of a hundred, she's one out of a few thousand. And then after he's revealed all of this to her, he then points out the wide variety of girls that the Don has been interested in. Old girls, young girls, fat girls, slim girls, blondes, brunettes, 
uh, prim and proper, fun-loving. And he sings this to a very beautiful bel canto line. So throughout all of this, we have a Leporello who's, if anything, as seductive as the Don ever is. But he's saying these really horrifying things to um, Donna Elvira. So that is another way in which the opera can have many, many layers of understanding. It is comic on the surface, but underneath it, it's fairly challenging for us. Um, now I want to play you something that is probably one of the two or three most famous tunes in the whole piece. Uh, a tune that actually appealed to the young Chopin a few decades later, who wrote a piece for piano and orchestra based on this melody. This is when we get to watch the Don actually attempt to seduce a peasant girl named Zerlina. And to, I guess, emphasize his amorality and his opportunism, it's Zerlina's wedding day to a peasant boy named Mazetto. The Don manages to get all the other peasants away, so he has Zerlina to himself. And he says, give me your hand. I'll take you to that castle over there, which belongs to me. I love you so much, I'm going to marry you. By this point, we know what he means by I'm going to marry. And Zerlina maybe goes along, maybe pretends to go along. So this is La ci darem la mano. Zerlina <clears throat> sings the same melody as the Count, which usually indicates, through musical means, that the two characters are at least of a similar mind. Now, I want to tell you the word andiam, andiam, let's go, let's go. And they both say it together, so it would seem that they're about to go into the castle of the Don and get up to some disreputable business, but they're stopped by Donna Elvira, who rescues Zerlina from the fate worse than death, but sometimes considered better than starving. And so Donna Elvira has thwarted the Don's attempt to seduce this young peasant girl. He doesn't stop with that, but we watch him foiled by Donna Elvira, who then sings an aria I want to just play the beginning of to demonstrate Mozart's mastery um, and his understanding of the trappings of opera seria, <coughs> all of which is this. Mozart slightly exaggerates the seriousness of Elvira's situation by having her sing in a rhythm that would have been more appropriate perhaps to handle. And that very majestic or maestoso kind of dotted rhythm is something we associate with the old operas that featured empresses and emperors and kings and queens and historical personages. By this time, you will have met just about everybody that we need to know, with one exception. I'm about to find him for you. Donna Anna has a boyfriend. And I'm going to tell you about him because I want to say a few words about the role of the tenor in a couple of these operas. Uh, Don Giovanni, baritone or bass baritone. Leporello, bass. The Commendatore, bass. Mazzetto, bass. These are all bass clef, low voice, fully mature male singers. Um, now, in uh, The Marriage of Figaro, there's really not much of a tenor at all. They have tiny roles. There is a pretty good role for a tenor in this one. This is Don Ottavio, and he is um, Anna's boyfriend, perhaps fiancé. And throughout the opera, he trails her around, swearing to avenge her dishonor by probably challenging the Don to a duel if they can get, ever get their hands on him. And this is where I want to say a couple of things about the whole tradition of 18th century opera moving from one place to another. Whether you were Handel or Mozart, you did the same thing. When Don Giovanni moved from Prague to Vienna for its premiere there, they changed the cast. Different singers were brought in. And so Mozart furnished them with different arias. Uh, Mozart always said, I must know who is going to sing the role before I can write the aria, because the aria must suit the singer like a perfectly tailored dress. And I would think he meant also a perfectly tailored suit. 
So for one of the, um, the incarnations of Don Giovanni, uh, the role of Don Ottavio was given a solo aria that's made up almost all of long legato um, expressive lines that would really, really demonstrate mastery of breath control. The other one really displays all of that too, plus mastery of rapid agile passage work. So today, as Maestro Timothy Vernon has said, nobody wants to give up either of them, either the tenor singing the role or the audience wanting to appreciate them. So you'll get to hear the wonderful Owen McCausland sing both of them. And uh, it's, a, it's a real treat. Yes, it's true that neither of them really advances the plot very much, but who cares? They're great Mozart. Uh, you're also going to get a chance to see one of the violinists in the orchestra um, change her persona a little bit as the Don sings a serenade under the window of the servant of Donna Elvira. So this right hand that I'm playing here, is played on the mandolin. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only Mozart opera that features a mandolin. And uh, one of our first violinists, Muge Butchelon, has played the mandolin well enough to play it in the last time we did Don Giovanni, so she will be featured, so we didn't have to bring another person into the pit to essay that role. So there's a couple more things. I said I want to say a few words about the components of the opera, and I've mentioned only the orchestral introduction, the overture, and several of the arias, and one ensemble, La Cida Rem La Mano. But the story is really told through the medium of recitativo secco, which if you've ever come to one of my talks about Mozart or Handel, you've heard me say before, a recitative is a type of singing in which the rhythms are very, very basic on the page, and the singer is responsible for converting them into speech-like rhythm. So minute and sometimes not so minute changes are made to the note values so that they won't sound like dance rhythm or rather uh, metrical rhythm. They'll sound like speech. That is generally accompanied only by the harpsichord. You'll hear Kim Bartzak playing the harpsichord in the pit, and sometimes someone will play along with the bass as well. This is to ensure that the dialogue is delivered fairly crisply. We don't spend a lot of time listening to the plot. We get on with it so we know what's going on. There's also something called recitativo accompagnato, and that's where the singer is generally left to his or her own devices to sing the, the notes in a speech-like rhythm, but the orchestra often gives you a kind of punctuation that's fully in the mood of the character. One of these was added for the Donna Elvira, uh, and it's one of my favorite passages of, uh, of our scenes in any Mozart opera. So she begins basically by saying, what unspeakable horrors, what crimes more terrible than anything he's committed before will now attract his fancy. And she sings, and the orchestra might punctuate. The horrible things has he done now to ruin my and everybody else's life. And then more orchestra, more exchange, more dialogue between the orchestra and the singer. This will inevitably set up a great aria. And there is no aria greater, in my opinion, in Mozart than uh, Mitra D, the, when Elvira reflects with fury, as well as incredibly virtuoso writing, um, about the betrayal she has suffered at the hands of Don Giovanni. Now, one of the great Elviras in history was uh, Elisabeth Schwarzkopf, and she sang this role many times, and she always said this aria was fiendishly difficult to sing. So I just go play it on the piano. It's not so fiendishly difficult for me. <laughs> A lot of notes, a lot of passage work, and all of it sitting at almost the most uncomfortable passage between a medium range and a high range for the soprano. It's an absolutely spellbinding showpiece. So I think we've met pretty much everybody. There is an aria for poor Mazzetto as well, and he will reconcile with his Zerlina, even if she did seem to flirt with the, uh, with the Don a little bit. 
But then we get to the finale. Now, Mozart has quite a lot of fun in the finale. And one of the things that both De Ponte and Mozart wanted to do as early as Figaro is uh, write finales that were less conventional and that, were, that provided the audience with more unexpected uh, plot twists and things. And that's precisely what they did and what they do in this. Now, one of the th ways in which Mozart has fun is this. He has the count, uh, Don Giovanni, I'm sorry. He has Don Giovanni sitting in his home, having a wonderful feast, to which he has invited the man he calls the stone guest. What this means is, and you'll see it happen, is that he meets the statue of the commendatore and it comes to life. And the Don Giovanni rather cheekily invites the stone guest, not the stoned guest, the stone guest, to dinner at his home, and the stone guest accepts. Keep that in mind. So the Don's at home. He's enjoying lavish food, not sharing any of it with Leporello, and he has a little band, as one does when one's an aristocrat. And the little band is playing many of the most popular operatic tunes of the day. And the Don's enjoying it until they play one that goes like this. Which happens to be from the Marriage of Figaro itself, the work that was so popular the year before. And he has the Don say, Oh, that stupid Figaro, take it off. One doesn't hear anything else every, anywhere but that stupid Figaro. So that's a wonderful little in-joke that the audience of 1787 would have appreciated very much. Now we're going to eventually see all the characters back on stage, but here's the last excerpt that I want to play for you, which is when the commendatore makes his entrance. It's meant to be very scary, and Mozart brings in instruments that he hasn't used, actually, in the opera until now. He uses this instrument in the Requiem, and he uses it in this point uh, as the Don is imminently about to be dragged down to hell. And this instrument's place, even in the symphony orchestra, wasn't secured until Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, um, what is it now, two decades after this work. I'm talking about the trombones. So here is where we'll hear the commendatore command the attention of Don Giovanni. I gave you my promise when you invited me that I'd come to dinner, and now I'm here. In the, in the text it says, with a clap of thunder. Something that virtually comes from the overture is now brought back as the commendatory makes his entrance. And there's these wonderful sort of uh, semi-dissonant, semi-chromatic scales, partly chromatic, partly diatonic, um, that, we'll, that we'll hear as the commendatory becomes more and more threatening to the dawn. As the commendatory says, I, I don't need to eat any of your food. It doesn't compare with what the, what the heavenly table has to offer. So ultimately, the commendatory offers the Don a chance to repent. All of this being watched by, by poor Leporello cowering in a corner. And when the Don refuses to repent, he's dragged down to hell, which is a pretty spectacular thing to have happen. Um, and at this point, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, there were many uh, conductors who felt that what Mozart did next was a bow to conventionality. They felt that after something so serious and so theatrical and dramatic as a person being dragged down to hell, the opera should finish. But it doesn't. Each and every one of the other characters comes back, and we find out what they're going to do. First of all, they all think that Don Giovanni's been dealt with as he deserved. Leporello has to go find a new master. Elvira decides to enter a nunnery, being dramatic to the last minute. Uh, Zerlina and Mazzetto can get married now. And uh, Donna Anna asks Don Ottavio to be understanding enough to permit her a year before they get married. So 
we decide what's going to happen, and they just basically sing, as happens at the end of really all three of the De Ponte Mozart collaborations, a kind of little moral that ties the story up, in this particular case, with what's called imitative counterpoint. In other words, Mozart never takes the easy way out, always the most dazzling, and the work is finished. So one of the questions which arises frequently uh, is how relevant is opera like this to the modern world? And it would seem very relevant. Um, the, the musical style is informed by the genius of Mozart, and it kind of never went out of fashion. Uh, the third and final collaboration of those two composers, Cosi van Tutte, was almost ignored in the 19th century. It was reviled by composers like Wagner because of what they felt was a kind of disreputable subject matter. Of course, it's one of the most popular works now, and it's continually presented. So the idea of um, behavior which uses other people, the idea of revenge, the idea of retribution, um, all of these things occur in Don Giovanni and would strike us as as relevant now as they ever were. So our director, Maria Lamont, has elected to set it very convincingly in a modern time without uh, in any way sermonizing. And so we can easily draw the parallel between situations that may have occurred in our own lives and certainly in the news and what is occurring in this particular work. Uh, the only other thing that I'll say now is this. The cast. One of the great treats of Pacific Opera is, of course, which something that directors like very much, is that they get to work on a new production with a fantastic set design, fantastic costume designs. And one of the treats also is that Maestro Timothy Vernon casts the opera so very well. And so you're going to hear a number of people make their debuts with the company, including the Don Giovanni, who's played by Daniel Okulich. Daniel Okulich has appeared in this room in another context, presenting other songs. But this is the first time he sung a role with us. Tracy Canton is singing the role of Donna Elvira. Cecil, uh, I've got to read, use my glasses. Cecil Muhir is playing the role of Zerlina. Some of the other people are old friends. Aviva Fortunata appeared with the company in Fidelio, and then again in Il Tritico and elsewhere. Uh, Owen McCoslin's an old friend who was in Il Tritico as well. Justin Welsh was last seen in Flight, which was the last main stage work we put on before we had to go into hiding, as it were. Peter Monahan's appeared with us and is in the film version of The Garden of Alice. And Tom Gertz, Thomas Gertz, who's been appearing with the company off and on for probably more years than he would like me to say, since they're actually decades. Uh, so it's fantastic to welcome our new artists into the POV family and, of course, the ones that are coming back and returning. And we're all pretty confident you're going to enjoy this Don Giovanni very much, and it is one of the greatest of all operatic masterpieces. Thanks for coming and joining me, and we'll look forward to the next time where we, I can look at your faces in the lobby of the Royal Theatre. Enjoy the show. Thank you.